Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 26 of 113 Minutes by James Patterson and Max DeLalo. So let's get right into this video. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, I suggest you click off the video now. You have been warned. 8 minutes and 10 seconds. They'll be here soon. I have to move fast. I can't let them catch me. Not like this. I'm curled up on the floor in a heap of tears. A few cardboard boxes are strewn around me. The emotions I'm experiencing are overwhelming and contradictory. Relief, worry, satisfaction, dread, you name it, I'm feeling it. I thought I was ready finally to sort through some of Alex's belongings. I was wrong. Again. After my failed attempt to enter his room a few weeks ago, interrupted by the local sheriff showing up at my door with Alex's friend Danny, the last person to see my son alive, I cut myself a little slack. Then I got caught up in the wedding and its flurry of final preparations, scrambling to get the house spick and span for the few dozen guests who would be tri try passing through it. I swept and dusted and vacuumed and polished every inch, well, almost every inch. My dead son bedroom was left completely untouched, the door still shut tight, and it was going to stay that way until I noticed it were in the wee hours after the wedding. It had been opened. This was after the last song had been played, the last drops of beer and bourbon had been drunk, the last of our friends and family had gone home, even Stevie and Kim, who live in the farmhouse themselves, had left. They'd been sleeping at Hank and Debbie's that night to give Mason and me the place to ourselves. Loopy and exhausted from all the stress and joy of the wonderful day, I didn't just let my strapping new husband carry me over the threshold. I teasingly ordered him to lug me all the way across the lawn, up the stairs, and into our bedroom. Good sport that Mason is. He happily obliged, but he demanded with a sexy wink that I find some creative ways to pay him back. We had just reached the top of the steps when I noticed the door to Alex's bedrooms was slightly ajar. I gasped, covered my mouth in shock. I leapt out of Mason's arms, nearly tipping over the train of my wedding dress. It was obvious enough that he had pro what had probably happened. One of our guests must have been searching for the bathroom and decided to keep the honest mistake to herself. But none of that changed the fact that Alex's bedroom's door was open for the first time in months. I slammed it shut as quickly as I could, then leaned my head against the door frame and let out a single sob. Mason came up behind me and wrapped his muscular arms. He just held me as I struggled to pull myself together. It was such an emotional day already, and now this. Too bad we splurged on the honeymoon suite, Mason whispered with a smile. I laughed. I had to. I needed to. God bless this man, I thought. An average new husband might be less than thrilled at the prospect of spending what should be his steamy wedding night chastely comforting his grieving new wife instead, but Mason was anything but average. He managed to make a sad moment tender and loving and funny all at once. I'm sorry, I managed to whisper, turning around to take in the handsome face. Nothing to be sorry for, he insisted. That's the nice thing about spending the rest of our lives together. We'll have plenty more nights to try again. Try again. That's what I'm doing right now and failing. Our wedding was a few weeks ago and Mason had been gone for almost all of them working on an important case that had taken him all over the state, but tonight was a special occasion. He was going to be nearby, he said, and had managed to get the night off, so I decided to cook a big family dinner. It would be the first time all of us, Stevie, Hank, Debbie, Kim, Nick, J.D., Mason, and me, gathered around the table since we tied the knot. It would be a celebration dinner of sorts, too. Our farm was saved. My hell of a plan was almost complete. Things were looking up for the Rourke family. We were all riding high, so I decided I might finally be ready to start going through Alex's stuff, not his bedroom. I knew I wasn't prepared for that yet, but I remembered my son had a few boxes of old junk hidden away in the attic, some odds and ends he hadn't touched in years, so I figured in an hour or so it would take for the pie crust to set and, and the chicken to finish roasting. These boxes would be as good a good place to start as any and so far they seem to be instead i find some old textbooks a dusty paperbacks a stack of cds from bands i'd never heard of a tennis racket still almost brand new that alex had just used once before losing interest in the sport forever it's all stuff i can easily donate or throw out with a second thought i'm nearly through all the boxes it's only taken a few painless minutes but then i reach to the bottom of the last box and i find something that takes my breath away it's a drawing Alex made when he was in first grade, two stick figures, a boy and a woman, both wearing giant space suits floating in the starry night sky. His teacher, Miss Cunningham, had written in blue marker and black letters at the bottom, when I grow up, I want to be an astronaut so I can go to outer space with mommy. Reading those words felt like a knife straight to the heart. For so many months now, I mourned the life that Alex had been leading in the present. I barely thought about the one he was going to lead in the future. 
His dreams of being an astronaut may have been a childhood fantasy, but his future had been very real. He'd been spending time with girls. He'd started talking about college. He was going to have a career someday, a home, a wife, children of his own. Alex would have reached the stars like he wanted to in his own way, on his own terms, if only he had the chance. I clutched the drawing to my chest and collapsed onto the floor, letting this profound new wave of grief wash over me, and I stay there, paralyzed, minutes ticking by, tears streaming down my cheeks. Oh, Alex, my baby. Will this pain ever go away? I know the chicken is still cooking in the oven and my family is on their way. I know I can't lie here forever, maybe just a little bit longer, when I hear something outside. A vehicle pulling up in the front of the farmhouse. I look at my watch. It's year early yet. The guests aren't supposed to ar be arriving for quite some time. Who could it be? I force myself finally to get up. I walk over to the attic window and peer down. The sun is setting and the vehicle is hard to make out. A few people exit, but I can't tell who they are. It must be Stevie and Hank and their wives, right? Who else could it be? That is the end of this chapter. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.